Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's installment of our live astronomy show. Uh, my name is Justin, one of the astronomers at the Science Museum. Uh, always happy to bring a little bit of the dome into your home. Uh, in case you're just joining us for the first time this week, we are on our way to the edge of the universe, but we're taking one small step every week, so we won't see everything out there today. Uh, we've made it most of the way through the solar system. Uh, we've got a little bit more to see. So we're going to be uh, in the outer part of the solar system out beyond Neptune, uh, seeing Pluto, uh, some of the other dwarf planets, things like that. Uh, as always, got a few announcements up at the top here. Do need to thank our sponsor for this series, Allianz Partners. Happy to have them on board. I will have some links for you in the comments uh, if you are able and uh, interested in helping the museum uh, support other ongoing missions. Uh, let's see. I also need to remind you that uh, we're using the same software uh, for this show as we use in the dome at the Science Museum. It's planetarium software called Digistar 6. Uh, it can do some pretty cool stuff and so I'm going to be watching it along with you uh, during the show, if you're able to watch on, on a nice big screen, if you've got a, a large monitor uh, that uh, you can go full screen on, I highly recommend it. It'll, it'll look pretty good there. Uh, so, uh, so let's actually switch over to that view and uh, get us up into space around the Earth as we usually start. Uh, now, it looks like the uh, the inbox is empty this week. Uh, I guess I answered all of the asteroid questions during last week's show. Uh, but I uh, do just want to uh, thank uh, one of our viewers. Uh, Tucker wrote in after last week's show. I had a question about how we use space science at the museum uh, to help with uh, his Out of This World uh, Nova Award uh, for the Boy Scouts. The answer was a little bit long for me to cover uh, during the show. Uh, but I just want to thank Tucker for writing in. Uh, as always, if you have questions uh, during the show, uh, feel free to leave those in the comments. We'll, we'll try and either address them during the show or, uh, or uh, you know, sometimes we, re we, re we revisit them in, uh, in the next stream. So uh, let's, uh, let's review just a little bit uh, to talk about where we have been and what we have seen. Uh, starting out here at the Earth, as always, uh, going to keep track of our distance from the sun in the bottom right for this first part of the show. Uh, in case you missed a couple of weeks ago uh, with the, the gas giants, uh, we're just recording that in astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the Earth's average distance from the sun. It's about 93 million miles. Uh, so altogether, so far, we've covered some 3 billion miles out beyond the orbit of, of the moon, the other inner planets. Uh, there are those asteroids we talked about last week, uh, the, uh, the other gas giant planets. So uh, Neptune, some 30 astronomical units from the sun, 3 billion miles away, give or take. Uh, so we're going to be out beyond Neptune today, uh, but since I didn't have any of your questions to answer today, I want to give you one bit of added content. Uh, all those asteroids that, uh, that we're seeing on the map right now, last week's topic, uh, showed you the first handful of folks to discover asteroids, those guys from Europe. Uh, the, the club of people who have discovered asteroids honestly hasn't grown all that much. I mean, it's certainly more than the four people we saw uh, last week, uh, but it's still a relatively exclusive club and certainly not all that diverse. Uh, but the good news is just about anybody can discover an asteroid. It's not that hard to do. Uh, you just have to have, uh, say, access to a big telescope and time to look through the pictures. That first step is probably the hardest one, uh, but there's a way around that little hurdle. Uh, there is a citizen science project that anybody can sign up for to help with. Uh, it is called Hubble Asteroid Hunters, and uh, we'll switch over to that screen. Uh, it's part of a, a collection of citizen science projects, uh, uh, part of the, the Zooniverse. Uh, there are many projects you can join in. We'll probably see others as we go on down the road. Uh, the URL isn't easy for me to say, so it'll be appearing in the comments for you uh, if you want to check it out. Uh, but, uh, but here's what the website looks like. Uh, I've uh, got uh, some examples of what you'll see. You can see that uh, they've got a little way to go yet. Uh, 
have uh, got about 44 complete done, uh, 44 percent of the way done on the project. And if you want to help out, it is as easy as this. Maybe start out on the training. Uh, my head's in the way of that button, but uh, there we go. There's a button that says training right here, and uh, that'll show you what you need to do. Now, uh, I've already been classifying here, so let's just restart the tutorial. It, it'll walk you through what to look for. You're just looking for the trail that an asteroid will make uh, as it goes through a picture, a real picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Now they show you a couple of examples as you click through here. This is probably the, the easiest one to see. I'll magnify it for you. Uh, so this, this is a, a digital camera on Hubble. Uh, so it takes these kind of long exposures to collect more light. And since asteroids are moving in their orbit around the sun, they'll leave trails or streaks in the images. Now uh, the way the uh, the images are processed, sometimes they're uh, what are called ghost trails, which is what they're showing you in this picture. So it kind of looks dark, like, like space behind it, but it has this kind of glow around it. Uh, sometimes they'll be brighter too, like that one. And, and you may also be able to see it's kind of broken up into different segments. Uh, because uh, multiple exposures by the camera have been combined. So uh, the asteroid kind of appears to blink off and on as it's streaking through the picture. Uh, but, uh, but, but kind of the coolest thing here, in addition to finding these asteroids, is you're looking at real pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. So there's all kinds of cool stuff to see. Like uh, this one has some pretty neat galaxies in the background if, if we zoom in on it. Uh, so, uh, so you know, you, you'll find some pretty cool stuff. And this is part of the, the, the training portion of the, the project. So it's also pretty easy to find asteroids in it. Like, uh, like here's one. Uh, we'll just say, yes, I see one. We'll mark both ends of that little streak. You can probably see going through the picture and say we're done. It's uh, it's as easy as that. Uh, so, uh, so there you go, Hubble Asteroid Hunter, if you want to join in the search for those little worlds. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about little worlds out beyond the orbit of Neptune. So uh, let's get out there. Let me get to just start back on my screen. All right, here we go. So uh, we are going to leave those little asteroids behind and talk about what's going on in the outer solar system. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I kind of told you about the discovery of Neptune and how it really started because astronomers noticed that uh, Uranus wasn't always exactly where you uh, you might expect based on a simple laws of, of physics. So uh, Le Verrier and Adams predicted that Neptune would exist and that they found it, but then Uranus still seemed to shift a little bit. And so many astronomers suggested that there might be another planet. This is uh, an illustration of multiple predictions that were put out by astronomers. Uh, none of them were right. A couple were kind of close. Uh, a search started by Percival Lowell eventually resulted in the discovery of Pluto. It was found at uh, Lowell Observatory by Clyde Tombaugh in 1930. So we got this little world. We, we called it a planet for uh, for a while. Uh, we're going to get to that. But but uh, but first, Pluto itself. Uh, to be affecting a planet like Uranus from, from so far away, Pluto would need to be pretty big. And I think it was the New York Times that when the discovery was first announced said this world could be the size of Jupiter. It wasn't quite true. Uh, stop me if you watched last week's episode and you've heard this story before. Uh, but astronomers find a new object where they think another planet might be orbiting the sun, but it's much smaller than they expect. Uh, in the case of Pluto, because it looks so small in those first pictures, uh, the initial guesses were, okay, maybe it's more the size of the Earth instead. And then, okay, maybe it's just a, a little bit smaller than the Earth. Uh, it took the discovery of a moon here to really nail down the size of Pluto. Uh, again, just, just working with, with pretty simple uh, laws of physics. If you find a moon going around an object, like uh, Sharon was found here in orbit around Pluto in the late 1970s. I think it really nailed down how big an object is, how massive it is. And uh, for Pluto, that got us a mass estimate or mass measurement that was much, much smaller than the Earth. Uh, there's the uh, the Earth for uh, for scale there. Uh, so so Pluto kind of kind of small. And it's got this really big moon. Uh, Sharon is about half the size of Pluto. Uh, so you're, you're seeing both Pluto and Sharon move around on your screen here, uh, that's because their mass is close enough to being equal that they both go around this empty point in space. So Pluto's moons don't truly orbit Pluto. Everything in the Pluto system kind of empties, uh, excuse me, orbits this, this empty point, which I think is 
kind of a surprising fact. But uh, here's another one about the Pluto system. We found some more moons here uh, in the uh, last 20 years or so. Uh, a couple more moons have been discovered using the Hubble Space Telescope. We now count five moons in orbit around Pluto, and all of them together uh, would fit inside Jupiter. So, so the orbits of all of these moons uh, around Pluto, or Pluto and the, the orbits of its moons around that empty point in space, smaller than Jupiter. I actually kind of uh, stumbled upon that number about a year ago, uh, almost to the day. Uh, so including that in your show today, because uh, I don't know, I thought that was kind of neat. So we've got this interesting little world, uh, all of its little moons here in a relatively small uh, space. And the maps you're seeing here uh, are constructed by the Hubble Space Telescope. Images taken about 15, 20 years ago have helped us roughly map the surface of Pluto and Charon. We're going to see a better map in just a little bit, but we've got a little more history to get through first. Uh, so we find Pluto, 1930, and then uh, all kind of like Ceres when it was found, and uh, well, then uh, they find Pallas and Juno and Vesta. Uh, the, the rest of this region of space starts getting filled in too, but it takes a little bit longer. The second asteroid is found just about one year after uh, Giuseppe Piazzi found Ceres. For Pluto, it's not until the year 1992 when another object turns up. This one was originally named uh, or designated 1992 QB1, and then the next year a couple more show up, and then the next year a few more show up. And then in the 90s, uh, like we saw the rate of asteroid discovery pick up, uh, this kind of picks up too. Astronomers know there are things out there. They've got these fancy new digital cameras, uh, so they're able to, to survey the sky, hunt down more and more of these objects. It wasn't really easy for this process to get started, though. Uh, the astronomers that found that first object, uh, now called Albion, uh, were David Jewett and uh, graduate student Jane Liu. Uh, now, when they found Albion, they were supposed to be working on another project they'd gotten funding for, they'd gotten telescope time for. Nobody would fund this search for other objects out beyond Neptune, like Pluto. Uh, so I guess they're kind of breaking the rules, uh, but uh, by, by breaking that, uh, that rule, uh, they were able to, uh, to reveal a whole new region of the solar system, which, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, so, uh, so here is uh, our map of the outer solar system as uh, it looks today. Found some, uh, some 3,000 objects in orbit around the sun out beyond Neptune. Uh, most of them are part of what we now call the Kuiper Belt, but uh, there are probably more out here scattered deeper in space. And, and based on what we have found so far, uh, astronomers are putting together a map of what they think the outer part of the solar system looks like. Uh, so from the 3,000 that we have found, the, the structures that are starting to show up in, in that collection of objects, uh, astronomers have models like the one that is going to appear on the screen in just a moment uh, that uh, there's a, more of a theory or, or a hypothesis for what uh, the, the outer solar system may truly look like. And now you're seeing some 66 thousand objects that uh, are representative of, of what may be out here. That There could be millions of objects out here, just like there are millions of objects in, uh, in the asteroid belt. Uh, we just haven't found nearly this many yet. But uh, now that we're, we're starting to, to get an idea of what this part of the solar system looks like, we can break these objects up into uh, different groups, uh, different uh, different families of objects, different categories of objects. Uh, let's let's look at a couple of them quickly. Uh, I've got some color coding going on on your screen. You might be able to pick out some of those colors. Uh, let's take a closer look at a couple of them. Uh, the red ones are probably the most interesting ones. Uh, those red objects are ones that are really controlled by the gravity of Neptune in some way. They're in orbit around the sun, but you're seeing uh, circles drawn around the sun at distances where objects can be in what we call a resonance with Neptune. I talked about Trojan asteroids last week, uh, those that orbit the Sun in the same amount of time that, uh, that Jupiter does. Uh, you could call that a one-to-one -one resonance. So Jupiter completes one orbit around the Sun, those asteroids complete one orbit around the Sun. There are other more interesting resonances out here in the Kuiper Belt, like uh, Pluto is an example of something on a three-to-two
two resonance. Uh, that just means that for every three laps around the sun that Neptune completes, uh, Pluto or these other uh, uh, so-called Plutinos uh, are going to complete two orbits around the sun. Uh, now I started uh, this example with uh, the planet and the Kuiper Belt object at the same point, but in reality that this resonance means that uh, the two worlds never get that close. And there are other resonances too, like uh, here's an example, I believe I programmed the uh, the 5 to 1 resonance. So, uh, so Neptune is going to complete five laps around the sun. There's one, there's two. Uh, this Kuiper Belt object now travels much farther from the Sun uh, completes just one orbit in the time it takes Neptune to complete five. Uh, there are other combinations, uh, four to one, five to three, seven to two. Uh, pick two numbers less than ten, and uh, there's probably a resonance where we find objects. In fact, uh, just recently, uh, astronomers picked out a couple of objects in a 9 to 1 resonance, meaning these Kuiper Belt objects take almost 1,500 years to, uh, to get around the Sun, but, but they're doing it in lockstep with, uh, with Neptune each time. All right, let's see. Uh, let's see what's next. Uh, well, we've got a lot of objects that also get pretty far from the sun here on long extended orbits. I've got them colored uh, blue and green on your screen. Uh, these are objects that have had encounters with uh, probably Neptune or, or the other gas giants. And they've kind of been scattered out into, into larger orbits. We'll talk about those in a second. Uh, but before we leave here, let's uh, let's focus on those uh, those white objects. Uh, those are what we would call the classical. Kuiper Belt. Uh, these are uh, the objects that are probably formed at a similar distance from the Sun, and they've always been in orbits like this. Uh, and uh, we, th we think these classical Kuiper Belt objects are kind of the frozen leftovers from uh, from the formation of the planet. So, so they're pretty interesting objects. If we want to understand how uh, the uh, the rest of the solar system formed, seeing these Kuiper Belt objects would be incredibly valuable. So, how do we get out to see a Kuiper Belt object? They're, they're billions of miles away. We need really big telescopes to reveal them as even tiny little dots. Well, we should probably send a spacecraft out there. Uh, so that's what finally happened uh, after a couple of false starts. Uh, the New Horizons mission is launched in early 2006. Its goal is to fly by Pluto, show us what Pluto is like, and they get on out into the Kuiper Belt and see what those other small objects are like, too. In about one year, New Horizons gets out to Jupiter, flies by Jupiter, gets what's called a gravi uh, gravitational assist, uh, actually speeds it up, so it gets through the outer planets a little bit faster. If you saw the show a couple of weeks ago, you know it can take a long time to get through the, uh, the outer planets. Uh, for New Horizons, it takes about nine and a half years. Uh, then it arrives at Pluto. And it gets to fly by Pluto. It has, uh, you know, a few days taking good pictures, but really its its best imagery comes from a few hours uh, around closest approach. So if you see any good-looking picture of, uh, of Pluto today, it's because of the flyby that took place on July 14th, 2015. Uh, you're going to hopefully recognize the uh, the Pluto system here. Uh, we've got Pluto near the, the center. We've got uh, the five moons going around it. Uh, but now, instead of the kind of fuzzy map from the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, you've got real nice images from uh, from uh, New Horizons. Uh, so here's a little bit of, of what it's found. Uh, there are all kinds of interesting things that I could point out to you here. Uh, first, I'll just zoom in a little bit because now that we have been able to see features on the surface of Pluto, we, we know where the mountains are, we know where the craters are, uh, we've started to name features on Pluto and uh, there's a couple dozen officially recognized names for features on Pluto and uh, I've got markers for them appearing on the globe there, but unless you're watching on a really big screen, you probably can't read them. Sorry about that. Uh, that big light tan patch front and center is called Sputnik Planitia, and uh, it is a, a vast plain on Pluto. Uh, it's probably uh, essentially a glacier, but instead of water ice like our glaciers here on Earth, uh, here on Pluto it is nitrogen ice primarily. Uh, there's some other ices mixed in there too. Uh, there is water uh, here on Pluto. It, it freezes. In fact, it freezes harder than ice. And uh, some of the things like the mountains, which uh, we can see over here, we'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, these mountains are actually made of, of water ice that is frozen harder than most rocks uh, here on 
earth. And kind of strange things happen here. Those mountains are uh, almost essentially floating on top of these other ices that exist on Pluto. Uh, so we've got mountains, we've got giant glaciers. Uh, this giant glacier may be in uh, an old impact crater that, that may uh, be related to the formation of the moons. Uh, uh, like uh, we think our own moon formed from a giant impact. Uh, Sharon and the other small moons here at Pluto may have been formed in a giant impact. Uh, my, my favorite thing about Pluto are these hills that are going to come into view momentarily. They're covered with these weird kind of blades uh, or spikes. Uh, when they were first spotted in images, uh, mission scientists nicknamed them snakeskin terrain. And, and maybe you can pick out those, those kind of strange, uh, strange textures there. Those now are thought to be uh, giant icy uh, blades or spikes that form, uh, similar to, to features called penitentes. You can get high up in the mountains when conditions are right here on Earth. Here on Earth, they're made of water ice. Here, it's probably methane ice, and, and they may be up to 10 times taller here on Pluto. Uh, there's an important reason for that, but uh, maybe we'll do a whole Pluto show someday and we can really get into the details uh, while we're here. And since we have a decent map, let's jump over to the big moon also. Let's go see Sharon up close, uh, about uh, about half the size of Pluto. Uh, some strange features that jump out here right away. Uh, we've got a, a darker pole on Sharon uh, that could be material that actually moves over from Pluto in a complicated relationship. Uh, this is actually the, the North Pole of, uh, of Sharon. Uh, the, the Pluto system is kind of tipped over on its side. You may have picked up on that when we saw it uh, at, a, at a wider angle before. So, so the North Poles of Pluto and Sharon point more or less towards the Sun today. And uh, here in the Northern Hemisphere we see lots of craters. Uh, There's this big series of, of canyons that kind of wraps around the moon. In the southern hemisphere, although a lot of it's hidden in darkness, overall the surface looks a little bit smoother over here. And uh, that may be because a lot of the surface of Sharon flooded uh, in uh, probably water, uh, and then that water froze and, and created the uh, the surface that we see on the moon today. Uh, so, so a ton of details revealed here by the New Horizons flyby showed that uh, well, dwarf planets can be uh, perhaps just as interesting as the major planets in the solar system. So uh, definitely worth exploring those in as much detail as possible. But we've got a bit more to see here. So uh, in the last part of the show, let's uh, let's continue on with the flight of New Horizons to uh, to see what else is uh, is out here. Its visit to Pluto was again just a, just a quick flyby, and then it continued on. And we're coming up on what the uh, the fifth anniversary of the Pluto flyby this summer. So uh, there's a chance for it to have encountered the the spacecraft to have encountered many interesting things. Uh, there are thousands of other objects out here with Pluto, but. Again, space is big, so these thousands of objects are uh, are spread out. It took a dedicated search by the Hubble Space Telescope to find another object that New Horizons could visit. It was originally designated uh, 2014 MU69. It now has a name. Uh, it is Arrokoth. Uh, so New Horizons flew by Arrokoth uh, oh, about a year and a half ago now. It was on New Year's Day 2019. And it revealed some interesting things here as well. Arakoth is a truly tiny world. You saw Pluto compared to the Earth. Uh, here's Arakoth compared to Virginia. Uh, it is uh, just over 30 kilometers from end to end, a little over 20 miles. Now, a few things that were seen during this quick flyby. Uh, uh, right away, what might jump out at you is the shape. It kind of looks like Arakoth used to be two objects. Uh, kind of like uh, you might build a snowman here by making two balls of snow and then sticking them together uh, to make Arakoth. Maybe the solar system made two icy objects and stuck them together. Uh, we think it's pretty common for there to be two objects orbiting around each other out here in the Kuiper Belt. I mean, we kind of saw it at Pluto, right? If it were just Pluto and Sharon, you'd have two objects orbiting around each other. We'd call that a binary object. Uh, here, uh, it's what we call a contact binary. So two worlds, were probably orbiting around each other for a while, then they got stuck together and formed what we see today. The really big surprise came with the uh, kind of overall three-dimensional shape. Uh, these two objects that got stuck together to build Arakoth, 
So they kind of flatten down. And if I see that if I rotate around here a little bit. And this shape unlocked a huge mystery in the formation of planets in our solar system. So, so the larger worlds, the dwarf planets, the planets. Uh, we think a lot of them started as something called a planetesimal. Uh, you know, asteroids maybe kind of, uh, uh, some of them might be leftover planetesimals as well. And we think these small Kuiper Belt objects are definitely leftover planetesimals, left over from the formation of the solar system. Uh, the shape of Arakoth supports a scientific theory called, uh, or a scientific mechanism for forming planets called the streaming instability. It's pretty complicated. I'm definitely not going to get into the details today, but if you want to have a little bit of fun uh, this afternoon, just Google streaming instability and uh, have a field day. It's pretty cool. It describes how we formed, uh, well, maybe everything else uh, in the solar system. Uh, that's the process that took over uh, some, some four and a half billion years ago and formed everything we see in the solar system. Uh, so, so pretty impressive to get that information from one quick flyby. And then, of course, New Horizons continues on. Uh, there's, uh, there's still a lot to see uh, in the, uh, the outer solar system. New Horizons looking for maybe additional targets it could fly by. None are known to exist right now. Uh, and there's another small problem. Uh, the New Horizons spacecraft is uh, um, approaching something called the Kuiper cliff. You might actually be able to pick it out on the screen. It's where the uh, the population, the, the number of objects, drops off suddenly. So when I had that full model up there on the screen before, you saw there were more objects farther from the sun. Uh, we think that the New Horizons is reaching the point where kind of the, the classical Kuiper belt ends. It's really the, the scattered objects that, that are much rarer and much more spread out uh, begin. So, so New Horizons may not be able to see another world up close. We have Another, uh, excuse me, we have other spacecraft out here too, uh, but uh, but they aren't going to encounter any other objects either, as far as we know. I just want to put these other spacecraft up here in their current positions because we'll uh, we'll probably visit them. Uh, later on in the show as uh, as well, uh, maybe next week as we get out among the stars. Uh, these are other interstellar spacecraft uh, to give you an idea of how fast and how far these spacecraft are going. Uh, New Horizons, you might still be able to pick out its location on the screen in the bottom right. I've got its distance uh, just shy of uh, 48 astronomical units from the sun. Uh, Voyager 1, our most distant spacecraft from the sun sticking out on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, you probably can't read that label, but it's just under 150 astronomical units from the sun launched way back in 1977. So it takes a little while to, uh, to cross the, uh, the solar system, but we aren't quite done yet. Uh, before we move on entirely from uh, this is part of the Kuiper Belt, what we've seen so far. Uh, oh, just have a quick message. Uh, can I spell Arakoth in case people want to look it up to learn more? Oh, sure. Let me just uh, get that up on your screen. Let's see. Just one moment. I've got to type a long command because I'm not sure the software will do it uh, automatically. And then I have to spell everything correctly, hmm. which I didn't do. So I'll just tell you, uh, it is Arrokoth, A-R-R-O-K-O-T-H. I'll try and track down the, uh, the correct label here. Uh, oh, I might be able to do it this way. I've always got some tricks up my sleeve here. Let's see if this works correctly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there it is. There's Arrokoth, uh, just in case you can pick that up on your screen. A-R-R-O-K-O-T-H. Uh, so there is that. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's continue on on our journey here. Uh, let's talk about the, the last kind of category of objects I haven't really delved into uh, too much. Well, I guess there are two. Uh, so I've talked a lot about asteroids. Uh, we've talked a lot about planets. We've seen their moons. Uh, I've alluded to dwarf planets a couple of times. We talked about what, what sets the asteroids, the dwarf planets, and the planets apart. Uh, because we aren't seeing a lot of these Kuiper Belt objects up close, 
we don't have great measurements of their size, but we can estimate their sizes. And we think there are probably hundreds that uh, satisfy all the conditions for being a dwarf planet in the solar system. So uh, they go around the sun, uh, they're rounded by gravity, and then they're in crowded neighborhoods like like the Kuiper Belt here. I've got the orbits of uh, some 130 objects on your uh, your screen. Uh, we think all of these probably qualify as dwarf planets, but uh, there's a whole range of sizes here. Uh, to give you an idea of what the largest dwarf planets look like, uh, here they are compared to our moon. Uh, so we've got our moon, and then there's Pluto and Eris. Those are the largest dwarf planets. They're, they're both out in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, then Haumea. That's a strange one with an odd shape. It's got a ring, a couple moons of its own. Uh, then a couple named Maki Maki and Gong Gong. Uh, those are both out in the Kuiper Belt as well. Uh, there are a few more in the Kuiper Belt, smaller than, uh, than Gong Gong, that dark red one. And that included Ceres there as well. Uh, that's the one we encountered in the Asteroid Belt last week. Uh, technically a dwarf planet as well. And and then more smaller objects in uh, in the Kuiper Belt that, that probably qualify as dwarf planets as well. Uh, the IAU, who made the rules, has kind of stepped down or, or stepped away from officially designating these objects dwarf planets. So uh, astronomers are kind of keeping track on their own, uh, doing their best to estimate what qualifies as a dwarf planet, uh, what is just a, a minor planet, an asteroid, a Kuiper Belt object, uh, things like that. So uh, there's one of our, our best estimates. Uh, one other strange thing about these dwarf planets, these Kuiper Belt objects, uh, some of them get very far from the sun. I mean, Pluto's orbit is a little bit extended, but some of these are huge. They, they travel hundreds of astronomical units from the sun, and astronomers have noticed something kind of strange about some of these really extended orbits. They seem to sort of be aligned with each other. You can almost break them up into a couple of groups. We've got several. They're stretching out to the right-hand side, of your screen right now. A uh, couple going to the left, a uh, couple kind of oddballs that don't really line up. But in the last couple of years, some astronomers have started to think that these aligned orbits of distant objects may point to another major planet in the solar system, another big one, uh, kind of like the early uh, uh, estimates for Pluto or uh, you know, bigger than Earth, maybe about the size of Jupiter. Uh, this hypothetical planet, uh, currently uh, nicknamed Planet Nine, is theorized to be a few times the mass of the Earth, maybe four or five times the mass of the Earth. I would uh, put it somewhere in size between your uh, Earth and, uh, and Neptune, uh, so, so a sizable planet. It'd be big enough to, uh, to have some, some gravitational control over these objects. Uh, their orbits are color-coded now based on how strongly this planet influences it, and uh, so the green ones are, are, are controlled by Planet Nine. They're in stable orbits. They may be in resonance like those smaller Kuiper Belt objects we saw. Uh, this is some more complicated physics that, you know, maybe if we do a whole show about Planet Nine sometime, we can really dive into. Uh, but I just wanted to, to give you an idea that there's this idea, there's another big planet in the outer solar system. So uh, for... Uh, for the question we, we posed before the show in the original post, uh, is there a ninth planet in the solar system? Well... The IAU says no. Uh, some astronomers say yes. Some say maybe. Uh, so it's a, an open question, something that people are still investigating. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm on board with the ninth planet, and hopefully one does turn up. Uh, so there you go, a whirlwind tour of the Kuiper Belt, uh, just about ready to leave the solar system. But uh, one thing that uh, we will see on our way out, uh, in addition to these Kuiper Belt objects made mostly of ice, we're going to see some other icy objects. I've alluded to comets a bunch, haven't really shown you any comets, so uh, two uh, quick comet items. Uh, here's an orbit of a, a typical short period comet. It's a, it's a pretty famous one. Uh, that light blue orbit belongs to Halley's Comet. It visits the inner solar system every 75 years or so. That's the big thing about comets. They spend a lot of time far from the sun. They're very icy, like Kuiper Belt objects, uh, but they have uh, been uh, uh, shifted into orbits that visit the inner solar system. When they get into the inner solar system, the sun warms them up, uh, vapor 
vaporizes that ice, comets grow tails. I talked about that a little bit last week with those centaurs or, or Jupiter family comets to get closer to the sun. Here, the orbits of a couple of comets have been in the news recently. Uh, the, the one kind of extending up uh, out, out of the top of your screen uh, belongs to one called Atlas after the survey that found it. Uh, the one kind of stretching out to the left belongs to a comet named Swan. Again, named after the survey that discovered it. Uh, Atlas uh, was in the news because it was thought that it might get bright enough to appear in our nighttime skies. That didn't really pan out, but something else kind of cool did happen. Uh, its tail was actually long enough that a spacecraft, the European uh, Solar Orbiter, uh, flew through the tail of this comet over the last few days. Uh, I've kind of exaggerated the size of the comet there and the spacecraft to help you see it. Uh, but these tails can be huge. Uh, the tail of Atlas needs to be millions of miles long for uh, for Solar Orbiter to, to actually uh, detect it. Uh, it's kind of rare for a, a spacecraft to fly through a comet tail like that. Uh, another recent example of it has been in the news recently and reveals just how extreme these comet tails can get when they approach the sun. Uh, a, a paper that hasn't even been uh, formally uh, uh, published yet but is on a uh, preprint server uh, details measurements from the Cassini spacecraft back in 2002. It may have flown through the tail of another comet when it made its closest approach to the sun. It's its perihelion. And if Cassini did detect charged particles, ions, from this comet, I would suggest the tail of this comet was about seven and a half astronomical units long. That's, uh, that's approaching a billion miles. So, so the, the tails of these comets can be truly immense structures, uh, and, and they point to, uh, to something else. Uh, the, the fact that these comets are coming in from so far away, they're so rich in ice, and can build these long tails, suggests that there may be many more comets much farther from the sun. I'm going to shift again to those orbits of Atlas and Swan that I showed you a moment ago. You can see just how far they extend from the sun, and uh, that suggests that there's a huge reservoir of comets out here. We can't directly map it. We can't see the objects when they're at these great distances from the sun. But thanks to Atlas and Swan, these comets that dive into the inner solar system, we can build models of what's probably out here. Just like we can build a model of what the rest of the Kuiper Belt looks like. And this suggests a huge cloud of icy cometary objects in the outer reaches of the solar system. It's called the Oort Cloud, and uh, the Oort Cloud may stretch about uh, halfway to the nearest stars. Uh, again, can't map it directly, can't see these objects directly, but something must be out there to supply these comets that fly into the, uh, the inner solar system. Uh, since we've flown out uh, beyond the Oort cloud, and I guess I could show you how far we are from uh, from the sun now, uh, I will, uh, will let you know that our next show is truly going to cross the distance uh, between the sun and uh, the other stars. So uh, we're going to leave the solar system entirely next week. Uh, we are going to get out into the Milky Way talk about some other stars. Uh, so I hope you can join in next week. Uh, continue our journey away from the sun. I hope you enjoyed the solar system. I think it's a pretty interesting place, uh, but there's a lot more to see. So join us again next week, again next Thursday afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're going to uh, head beyond the, uh, the solar system out among the stars. Hope you can join us for our next live astronomy show. Until then, uh, have a nice week. Uh, be safe out there, and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching.